diabetes. <laughs> okay, to be a little bit more PC about this, I have been living with diabetes for about 10 years now, and uh, it sucks. So I have to give myself injections, I have to go to doctors, and no, this, this is not a pager in my pocket, it's an insulin pump. It's actually connected right about to your body. here. Whoa. And it's delivering insulin into my system 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And that is because in 1922, doctors discovered that by administering insulin to a person with diabetes, they could drop elevated and fatal blood sugar levels and prolong their life from a matter of months to a couple of years. And here's the crazy thing. <laughs> Despite this awesome new device that totally makes me spart cyborg, um, that's exactly where things still stand. 90 years later, all medical industry knows is treating diabetes with insulin can actually extend a person's life expectancy, but there's no cure. So now I can talk about how this works all the time, but what you need to know is that the better you get at titrating the right amount of insulin, the longer you live, the better your quality of life, and the more you push back things like dialysis, blindness, etc. Now, I would have died about nine years ago had I not had insulin, and I gratefully hope to live another 50 plus with it. But here's the downside of using insulin. It's a fucking tightrope walk. It is, if I take too much, and we're talking about like milliliters here, I could die in anywhere from 15 to 60 minutes, no joke. And this is because you actually need a certain level of sugar in your bloodstream for your brain to continue functioning. So this shit will kill you and fast. And that is why I always carry in my purse these. <laughs> um, it used to actually be lifesavers, which I found blissfully ironic because those <laughs> candy sugar bombs actually really, really did save my life on numerous occasions. But after like the 5,000th lifesaver, I needed a change, so now it's Starburst. So, okay, so last Tuesday I'm driving home from work down 6th Street and uh, starting to feel off, so I reach into my purse and I find only two individually wrapped tiny little Starburst left, and that is not enough to fend off what I am now starting to feel coming, and so I quickly ingest those and turn left up Highland Avenue in search of a place to purchase more Starburst. Now, had I turned right at that moment, I was one block away from 7-Eleven, a potentially life-saving haven of fill of sugary snacks, and as a person living with diabetes in Los Angeles, I know where every fucking one of them is. <laughs> but instead, I, my hypoglycemia has already killed off enough brain cells so that, uh, I think that going left into bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on Highland is the ideal route to save my life. And now as my tongue is becoming numb and my arms are starting to tingle, I realize that I'm stuck, blocked on all sides by rows and rows of cars and rows and rows of mansions with enormous front lawns. And so I'm thinking, okay, why didn't I turn right? It was right there. And should I stay on Highland? Should I make the next right? Should I just get out of my car and ask somebody for, if they had a granola bar on their fucking dashboard? I don't, I don't know what to do. And <laughs> Clearly, I am here tonight. So you can deduce that I made it to the 76 gas station on Highland and Melrose to buy and ingest two candy bars and half a bottle of Gatorade just in the nick of time. But those last nine gridlock blocks were fucking terrifying. And so I am here to tell you that the best offense is a great offense. <laughs> Terrier discussing a passage from Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince, which encourages its reader to embrace one's enemy as an offensive maneuver. This 500-year-old 80-page treatise remains one of the most influential political essays in Western literature and a go-to for poli-sci majors in, interested in the art of war and politics. Its teachings have been utilized from everyone from Winston Churchill to like Adolf Hitler, from Steve Jobs to Donald Trump, but this little bit, embracing one's enemy, is not as prevalent in practice as the more aggressive Machiavellian tactics, unless you're looking at the practice of leaders like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King. Those prodigious leaders read Machiavelli's 500 years old words and got it. They understood that we are all pulling a long range game of chess. We're playing this game through aggressive jumps up and over the night or like a single well-timed single step forward with a pawn and we're all trying to get ahead and prove our station and stay alive and this is why Gandhi sat down to tea with British colonizers who had invaded his homeland and Martin Luther King organized non-violent protests in response to egregious atrocities blacks were enduring in this country. These were not defensive maneuvers. These men understood that in order to succeed and in turn improve and prolong the lives of millions, they must work offensively. Embracing their enemies and enacting short and long range tactics that could be perceived pris prismatically as persuasively compassionate or strategically deceptive or plain old welcome open arms. And the words laid all on the line and equally live to find another day come to mind because their inspiring actions were beautifully executed tactics in a larger game plan demonstrating their powerful grasp of an offense like embracing one's enemy.
I bring up these specific examples because when we think of things like offense and defense, it's easy to jump to more violent examples like sports and war. I mean, we have all yelled defense at a football game or basketball game, but here's something I want to point out. On that moment, on the field, in that moment, the players aren't thinking about being offensive. They are thinking, hey, there's the ball, I gotta catch it and run towards the end zone. Uh, they're not thinking defensively, they're thinking, hey, they've got the ball and are headed towards the end zone, I should hit them with my body. <laughs> These players are in the moment, reacting to the current scenario and pulling from a set of predetermined and previously calculated actions as part of a larger strategy crafted by their coach. And that strategy was set in motion back at training camp months ago and is now finally coming to fruition in this beautifully, this beautiful moment of preparation meeting opportunity. So whether they have the ball or not, they are on the offense and have been since day one of training. Players, soldiers, politicians, CEOs, they are all on the offense, responding to what's in front of them in order to move forward towards a predetermined goal. Playing defense doesn't actually exist. Yeah, that's just a term we created to define the actions of those who don't have the ball or appear to be losing. And so often, we link the idea of offense or being offensive with being aggressive, but it's really not. It's about being prepared to act, being two steps ahead, leading, being out in front of something, prepared for whatever life throws us. And this is why I now carry around these with me. <laughs> this is me being on the offense and more specifically embracing my enemy. And trust me, I spent years refusing this fucking enemy, pretending my disease was not a big deal and ending up in life-threatening scenarios just like last Tuesday. But now, that is the exception, not the rule. And it was a great reminder that I am still playing this game called life and embracing my disease, and so that I can play the long game. If I want to live a full life, I have to choose my choices and be on the offense and take my insulin, and go to my doctor's appointments and carry Starburst everywhere, and it's exhausting, but I refuse to let this thing defeat me, ever. <laughs> <laughs>